at the very at the at the very end, let's just plan after we do the Alleluia. To we'll just end. We we won't we won't take the sing phrases sing phrases. We'll just stop and on that ease. Right. Sing phrases. Yeah, so we won't take that very last line. I think that was too long. Left. Let's go. Yeah, let's go slow. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to worship at uh, Sleepy Hollow Presbyterian Church, both you who are here in the sanctuary and those of you who are online. I'm Joanne Witt, uh, your preacher for today while Sherry Hauser is on vacation. I'm delighted to be with you once again. My understanding is that it, it is the second Sunday of the month that you uh, recognize people's birthdays in, uh, in July. So let's do that right now. Is there anybody in the sanctuary or online whose birthdays you want to come on up july birthdays seventy seven on seven seven that's kind of magical seventy seven in a holy number too right oh, okay okay that's great seventy seven mountain biking wonderful okay the twenty first you want to you want to come on up or are you happy where you are He's happy where it is. Okay, we'll, we'll bless you from afar. I'm okay. Any, yes. 
July 1st. So she just 18 years old, important birthday. I am also a July birthday. My birthday is July 24th, which means I just made it as a Leo. Um, <laughs> yes. The 16th of July. Sixth. Sixth. Okay, so she's already had her birthday too. Yes, Corin. That's a concentration in July, yes. Yeah, thank you, thank you. A anybody else? Yes. July 19th. 22nd. July is a popular month. Yes. July 7th. And is she on a mountain bike today? <laughs> July 8th. Mm. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, please join me in prayer for a birthday blessing. God of grace, we thank you uh, for all of these people who celebrate this month, uh, celebrate being born. We thank you for the families that raise them and for this community that nurtures them. Uh, may they have many, many more years to celebrate being part of this community and part of this world. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. <laughs> Please join me in the call to worship. We come here shouting, our voices lifted in praise. We come here singing, our songs full of joy. We come here dancing, our hearts rejoicing. To the Holy One who is worthy, all praise and glory forevermore. Let us worship God. Please stand and sing the opening hymn number 15, all creatures of our God and King. And all creatures of our God and up your voice and with us sing Alleluia Alleluia Oh brother son with golden gleam Oh sister moon with silver gleam Sing praises Alleluia 
And all who for love of God forget All who in pain or sorrow grieve Alleluia, Alleluia Christ spares your burdens and your fears So Please join me in the unison prayer. We, sorry. we confess that often we do not see the beauty that is in the world for us to enjoy, do not recognize the love that is offered to us each day, are too busy with our own tasks to see if they fit into God's plan, are afraid to risk to turn the corner to empty the cup to dance. to dance. Forgive, Forgive us, us, O God, God and help us to accept, accept your, your gift of resurrection. resurrection. Please take a moment to listen for God's loving voice for you today. Amen. Friends, God continues to surprise us with compassion and mercy. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now, as those reconciled with God, let us share a sign of reconciliation with our neighbors. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Sure sign. brave guy. I'm Joanne. What, you want to tell me your name? Say it again. Winston. Winston is a brave guy to come up here and be the one kid. I asked my son Pete, my son Pete is now almost 23, but I asked him what, what makes him say wow. And he said something like, uh, so seeing somebody do a backflip, that makes him say, wow. Uh, he loves to play baseball. He said, seeing a really great play uh, makes him say, wow, a great baseball play. What makes you say, wow, Winston? Um, 
something amazing. Do you guys want to jump in there? Yeah. Yeah, that's a wow. What do you think? Anybody else? Pretty sunset. Yeah, that's a wow for sure. Anybody else have have some? Yes. Good music. Yeah, I I always say wow for you guys. Thank you. This view, this this whole thing here is kind of a wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes saying wow isn't enough. Uh, sometimes uh, people want to do something more to move. I have something I call a happy dance. I'm going to do it. And you can do it with me if you want, okay? It, it's the kind of thing that you have to kind of get it going the, the right way. You want to try it? You want to try it? No? You're going to skip it? All right, all right. Um, today in the Bible, we're going to read about King David uh, doing basically his version of a happy dance. Uh, he's very happy because he had a feeling that God was especially present with him, and we'll, we'll talk about why that is and how that happens. Uh, but he was celebrating by dancing. Uh, so what kind of things do you do to celebrate? If, you know, when you're really happy and you're going to celebrate something big, what do you do? Party or get together? Um, cheer. cheer, yeah, right. Smile or hug, yeah, those are good ones. Uh, one of the messages in this story today uh, is that celebrations are really a gift, a gift from God. That's kind of how we're made uh, to celebrate and to, and to enjoy. And so when we celebrate, I think it's a good thing to remember this is, this is you know, something God has built into us which is pretty wonderful. Um, I know that I have taught you folks the pretzel prayer before. I don't know whether you remember it. It's a repeat after me prayer. Uh, and it has three parts, which is why it's called the pretzel prayer, you know, like one of those pretzels that has three parts. And it goes like this. So repeat after me. God, I love you. Help me to love others as you love me. Amen. Thank you, Winston. Please join me in prayer. God, as we read this uh, ancient scripture, we ask you to open our hearts and minds to what it might be saying to us in 2024. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is 2 Samuel chapter 6, and I'm reading verses 1 through 5, and then 12b through 19. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went in front of the ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it, 
and David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their homes. The word of the Lord. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I want to say a couple of things before I jump into the sermon. First is, I've mentioned to a handful of you, I have a cold today, which is why I'm not hugging or uh, shaking hands. I tested. It is not COVID, uh, but I do have a cold, and so I've got a box of Kleenex down here. So I'm sorry for that. The other thing is, um, I, I didn't get up this morning and rewrite my sermon in light of what happened yesterday. Um, I'm, you know, I will touch on it, and I will certainly touch on it in the prayers. And I guess the thing I want to say is that um, we've reached a place where it is, it is just far too, far too ordinary uh, for there to be extreme gun violence in our country. So um, we, we need to get past that place. So, David, David and his dance. The Old Testament passages in the lectionary this, this summer trace Israel's transition from a group of tribes to a kingdom. In 1 Samuel, we're in 2 Samuel today, in 1 Samuel, the people demand a king, even though God warns them that that's a big mistake. God eventually decides to go along with the king idea, but the first king, King Saul, doesn't work out. And so God has the shepherd boy David anointed in secret. Young David fights with Saul against the dreaded Philistines, but eventually it dawns on Saul that the hugely popular and politically savvy David is a threat to his throne. David flees from Saul hiding out with the Philistines. Yes, those same Philistines. Saul is so badly injured in a battle with the Philistines that he asks that he be killed because he can expect worse from the enemy. Saul's sons have been killed as well, and so the door is now wide open for David to grab the throne, which he does. He's crowned king at Hebron, which serves as his capital. He accomplishes what Saul could not, uh, soundly defeating the Philistines. On the heels of this victory, he decides to change the capital to Jerusalem and celebrates this by moving the neglected Ark of the Covenant to a place of honor, truly making it the city of David. And that's where we catch up with the story this morning. Anyone who's seen Raiders of the Lost Ark knows that the Ark of the Covenant is a wooden box covered with gold, and you seriously don't want to mess with it. The Ark was a precious and powerful symbol of God's presence. It's first described in the book of Exodus. The Israelites were told to build the Ark so that they could carry the covenant, the law that God gave them at Sinai, as they traveled through the wilderness to the Promised Land. The ark is described at several places in scripture as God's throne. God was believed to sit right there on what was called the mercy seat, literally sit there between two winged cherubim on top of the ark. Raiders of the Lost Ark agrees with scripture to the extent that the ark represented the kind of holiness that can be a holy terror. The ark helped win the battle of Jericho and when the Philistines captured it, it made everyone who came near it so sick that they gave it back. If you touched the ark, if you looked at it the wrong way, or if you talked about it the wrong way, it just might be the last thing that you did. All this sounds pretty strange and foreign and ancient, but then we're dealing with a very foreign and very ancient text here. When we meet up with David, no one has thought about the Ark of the Covenant for about 20 years, but David remembers it. The Ark represents God's presence with Israel, God's solidarity with Israel. 
It's just what David needs to announce that he is the rightful, legitimate successor of the old order, the tribal order, the order that values the ark and everything it stands for. This is the order that he wants to unify as his kingdom. And Jerusalem, which is located in neutral territory between the north and the south, pleases the different factions he's trying to bring together. Along the journey, as the ark is brought into the city, we're told twice that David dances with all his might. And based on the taunts of his wife, Michael, a few verses beyond where we read today, uh, the linen ephod he wore, whatever it is, wasn't enough. She accuses him of uncovering himself as any, she, this is what she says, as any vulgar fel fellow might shamelessly uncover himself. Nevertheless, the ark is there, uh, then to these ancient, if the ark is there, then to these ancient people, that means God is there. And David's response to God's presence is unfettered and unashamed celebration. Now, the temptation may be to say that that's an all the time rule. Uh, to the appropriate response to the presence of God is unbridled joy. But we are no longer a people that believe that God is most present when God is riding on the top of an ark. We believe God is present with us all the time, everywhere, even when we aren't sure of it, and even when we're pretty sure that we feel abandoned by God. So sometimes the appropriate response to God is unbridled joy, but other times it might be unbridled weeping or unbridled gratitude or even unbridled anger. The common word in these phrases, of course, is unbridled. David danced with all his might, gyrating, sweating, looking foolish, the Hopi Indians say, to watch us dance is to hear our hearts speak. The appropriate response to the presence of the Lord is the kind of risky authenticity that allows others to hear our hearts speak. It was nine years ago this summer that nine African Americans were murdered during a Bible study at the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, yet another example of gun violence in our country. Barack Obama, who was president at the time, delivered the eulogy at the memorial service for the pastor of that congregation, Clementa Pinckney. In the middle of his eulogy, Obama sang Amazing Grace. It was an unforgettable moment, an incredibly moving moment, regardless of your political preferences. The eulogy was the president's most forthright and public acknowledgement of the racial divide in our country and what it means to be black in America. Blinded by hatred, Obama said, the killer had failed to comprehend what Reverend Pinckney so well understood, the power of God's grace. And then the president paused a fraction of a second and you could sort of tell he was thinking, am I gonna go through with this or not? And he did go through with it. He began to sing. Barack Obama has a good voice. So this was not a risk for him in the same way it would be for some of us, for me, for example. But it was a tremendously vulnerable act, an act that drew people into the moment in an emotional way that words alone cannot. We could hear his heart speak. Was the president's song also politically savvy? Biblical scholars look back at King David's dance and ask, was this just a little bit of street theater, a photo op worthy of Carl Rove and James Carville's combined efforts in order to put David's greatness on full display? Or was it authentic? Was David genuinely joyful and profoundly grateful for God's presence and expressing this in front of the whole community in a way that they could hear his heart speak? Yes and yes. Such is the complexity of King David and Barack Obama and every human being that I know. It was still one of the post, most powerful moments of King David's reign and in my humble opinion of Barack Obama's presidency. You and I are neither king nor president, but here's the thing. It isn't just presidents and kings 
who have this impulse, who feel the call, who feel led to dance before the Lord with all their might. For you, it might not look like King David. It might not look like kicking up your heels like Gene Kelly. It might not look like Barack Obama singing in front of a nation that was sorely in need of healing. It might feel like unalloyed joy, but it might not. It might just feel like sticking your neck out because that's what God is nudging you to do. Why would God do that? Why would God nudge us to sing or dance or stick our necks out? Because of exactly what the nation saw with President Obama. When we let others hear our hearts speak, it creates connection. It spreads compassion and helps others to be courageous and authentic themselves. Brene Brown tells a story about running into Nordstrom to pick up some makeup. She says she was in one of those nothing fits and I feel like job of the hut moods, wearing her baggiest sweats and her hair pulled back because it needed to be washed. I don't know about you, but I usually feel underdressed for Nordstrom regardless of what I'm wearing. On the way to the mall, Brown's eight-year-old daughter, Ellen, reminded her that she needed to exchange, exchange some shoes, so after the makeup, they went uh, to the kids' shoe department. As soon as they cleared the top of the escalator, Brown saw a trio of gorgeous women in the shoe department tossing their long, clean hair over their narrow, square shoulders, watching their perfect daughters try on sneakers. One of Brown's guideposts is to give up comparison, so she focused on the shoes. But out of the corner of her eye, she saw a strange blur of jerky movement. It was Ellen doing the robot to a pop song playing over the store's speakers. At that moment, Ellen looked up and saw the magnificent moms and their matching daughters staring at her. The moms looked embarrassed, and the daughters looked as though they were on the edge of doing something mean-spirited. Ellen froze still bent over with her robot arms stiff. She looked up at Brown with eyes that said, what do I do, Mom? Brown says her default response would have been to shoot a diminishing look at her daughter that said, geez, man, don't be so uncool. Her first instinct would have been to save herself by betraying Ellen, but she did not. She writes, thank God I didn't. Some combination of being immersed in this work having a mother instinct that was louder than my fear and pure grace told me, choose Ellen, be on her side. Brown glanced up at the other mothers and then looked at Ellen. She reached down as far as she could into her courage, smiled and said, you need to add the scarecrow to your moves. So Brown let her wrist and hand dangle from her extended arm and pretended to bat her forearm around. Ellen smiled, Brown and Ellen stood in the middle of the shoe department, the Nordstrom shoe department, practicing their moves until the song was over. Brown wasn't ever sure how the other shoppers responded to their shoe department soul train because she never took her eyes off of Ellen. To watch us dance is to hear our hearts speak. This means, brothers and sisters, that the appropriate response to the presence of the Lord is to be uncool, to take off the armor, take off the mask, to shed that air of cool distance, let it all hang out, to dance with all our might or sing with all our might or write poetry or paint or share a vulnerable story or weep because letting our hearts be heard is what the moment calls for. That is how we connect to each other and that is what God wants for us. And here's another thing. When we don't give ourselves permission to be free, we rarely tolerate that freedom in others. We put them down, make fun of them, ridicule their behaviors, and sometimes shame them. We can do this intentionally or unconsciously. Either way, the message is, geez, man, don't be so uncool. Either way, it disconnects us. So, what might risky authenticity look like for you? In what small way might you allow others to hear your heart speak this week? 
that is how we connect with each other. And that is what God wants for us, that connection. And I believe with all my heart that God also wants for us singing and laughing and dancing. God gave us these gifts to connect and to enjoy. May it be so for you and for me. Amen. Let us be at prayer together. God, who is present now and always, we are not here in order to be religious. We seek an experience of life. We seek joy, not proper decorum and dignified stillness. Even now, when there is silence and stillness in our worship, may it be filled with you playfully tweaking our hearts with joy and delight. Animate us. Help us show up before you with the expectation that we will never be the same. Let persistence rise above discouragement. Let bold insistence for justice overwhelm our tendency to lean into complacence. Let us dare to step into the flow of the Spirit that we might be ready to see what the Almighty can do in us. O oh God, we bring our prayers this morning for our world. We pray for our nation in the wake of yesterday's assassination attempt. We cry out with our president, we can't be like this. Help us to address gun violence, both the access to guns and the quick impulse to use them. We pray for the families and loved ones of those who died in this incident, aware that thoughts and prayers are inadequate. We lift up those impacted by the hurricane in Houston, the wars in Ukraine and Gaza, the heat waves here in California and across the country, our warming planet. We ask that you would grant traveling mercies to all those who are traveling, Grant wisdom, discernment, and abundance of great candidates 
to Sleepy Hollow's pastor nominating committee. Oh God, each of us brings a hurt, a hope, a concern, a joy, and we lift these prayers to you. God, in your grace. Hear our prayers. Together we join our voices in the prayer that Jesus taught his friends to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us those trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sleepy Hollow was able to continue the ministries that it does uh, because of your gifts. Uh, let us bring our gifts to for the work of Sleepy Hollow and the work of God.
Please join me in prayer. Creator God, we thank you for this glorious summer day, for this warm and welcoming community, for Sudafed, for all those who reach across wide divisions to create connection, understanding, and peace, for all those who strive to do your will for dance, for song, for laughter. All of these and all we have are part of your abundant creation, the gifts that we have from you. We return but a portion of those gifts to you and ask that you would use them and our very lives to do your work in the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Are there announcements this morning? So to, to participate in the farm stand, they contact you? Thank you. So, so for those online, worshiping with us online, that was an announcement to contact Bridget. Uh, if you want to work on the farm stand, also a, a pitch for the Tuesday night street chaplaincy dinners. I will vouch for that. I have a great time every time I've done it. It's a, it's a really rewarding opportunity. It takes place at uh, First Presbyterian Church, San Rafael, on Tuesday nights. Other announcements? No other announcement other than choir. Get up here and help me lead this song. Please join in the closing hymn, which is number 80, You Shall Go Out With Joy. All right. As you know, we have very strict traditions here, and we adhere mostly to the one that, in, that, uh, that, uh, that involves choreography. So remember, if you're not sure what to do, watch, uh, watch the choir, but we will strictly adhere to you. All the trees of the field will clap their hands. All right. And we'll sing it until everyone does it. <laughs> There's no school tomorrow. I will turn this car around. Okay, one, two, three. You will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There will be shouts of joy and all the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands. Here we go. And all the trees of the My charge to you this morning is to think about uh, what it might be that you can do in the coming week to let people hear your own heart speak. 
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all today and evermore. Go in peace.